This is a story of decline, determination and hope, set in the beautiful Hampshire Avon Valley downstream of Salisbury. This was once the most famous angling river in England for that all-time favourite fish and vital part of Britain's biodiversity, the roach. Most adaptable of fish, roach live pretty much everywhere, in lakes and canals as well as rivers, but the Avon's fast-flowing chalk-filtered waters are the mecca for big roach. But not anymore. Shoals like this have become extremely rare, and though the reasons are many and complex, there's one that's decisive a foreign invader that pillages our rivers and lakes. The cormorant, a silverfish killer unmatched in nature. This is one of the lucky ones that escaped an attack from these non-native cormorants that prefer living near fresh water. Carbo sinensis. These cormorants started to colonise inland from Europe in the early 80s and by 2005 they'd increased to 2,096 breeding pairs. Wintering numbers now stand at more than 23,000 and each cormorant eats about a pound of fish a day. So it's no wonder that recent Environment Agency surveys have shown that most of the middle reaches of the Avon are devoid of roach. So once famous places like Ibsley Bridge, scene of many catches of a lifetime, have virtually no roach left alive. The royalty fishery still has a small population of roach, along with Longford and Britford near Salisbury, but the rest of the river has few survivors. It's bad news for fish-eating birds such as herons, grebes and kingfishers, and bad news for the much-loved otter. But in those places that do still provide a protected environment for roach, spring is a vital time of year, for as day length increases and water temperatures rise, the surviving roach gather to spawn and attempt to make up for their losses. And this is where determination comes into our story. Saddened by the denuded river, members of the Roach Club were determined to try to reverse the declines and they were led by Trevor Harrop and Budgie Price. They decided to enter the challenging and fraught world of fish farming. But what they needed was roach eggs and lots of them, so came up with a novel new use for old keep nets. Fixing slivers of netting to boards, they pinned their hopes on the roach laying their eggs on this soft fabric. But would it work? Their dream was to restore self-sustaining populations of true Avon roach and planned not only to raise thousands of them for release along the river valley, but to create habitat where they would be protected from predators at their most vulnerable time of life. They fixed the boards in places where they knew that roach had spawned in the good old days and hoped the remnants of the survivors would contribute their eggs to the project. Most of us believe that roach prefer deep water and gentle flows, and most of us would be wrong, especially when they spawn. Fish eggs need lots of oxygen to survive and the tornado-like conditions below weirs provide plenty of oxygen. But it does seem incredible that roach can thrive in this fierce current and their eggs are clinging to the netting too. So maybe Trev and Budge's plan will work. Roach prefer to lay their eggs onto strands of this willow moss or fontanalis to the scientists among us. But collecting eggs off this weed is difficult, so if the roach lay on the netting, life will be much easier. It's mid-April and the roach have gathered in their spawning garb, those knobbly tubercles on their heads, and have started laying eggs on the fontanalis. 
Nearby are Trevon Budge's spawning boards and the roach have gathered alongside them and seem interested in this new idea. In fact, they're like bees round a honey pot and compared to Fontanalis, they prefer the netting. Don't you just love it when a plan comes together? For not only are they attracted to the idea, they're actually spawning. The females force their way right into the netting to lay their eggs and the males hover nearby so they can fertilize them after laying. It's a joy to behold the start of a 10-year plan. Gatherings like this are a predator magnet, so the roach are nervous, not just of the one-eyed camera, but of that traditional foe, the pike. Now they face a more lethal predator, the cormorant, and this poor fish has been nearly cut in half by the hooked beak. But she's a survivor and soldiers on, determined to pass on her genes. If all goes to plan and water temperatures remain suitable, the nets will be covered with eggs within a few days. Remarkably, the roach spawning frenzy is coordinated by nature throughout the river, all the way from Salisbury to Christchurch. When good numbers of eggs have been laid, the nets are gathered up by Trev and Budgie and carefully transported in tanks of river water to Trev's garden, where the eggs will hatch in specially designed tanks. that little lot, mate. Oh, wow, they have been busy. Beautiful, eh? Yeah. What is it about these boards, Trevor? Amazing. Fantastic. Uh, Magical, aren't they? Wonderful stuff. takes about 10 days, followed by weeks of careful nurturing, fed twice a day so the hatchlings can grow and gain strength. After two months, they're fed once a day, every day, and protected from predators, nature is cheated because growing up in a safe environment, almost all of them survive, whereas most of those in the wild get eaten. So they grow on in safety through the summer, the autumn and winter, until the following spring, when Trev's garden is home to tens of thousands of 11-month-old roach, all perfectly formed and ready for the next stage of their young lives. From small beginnings, the project has grown to industrial proportions, not least because the Environment Agency loaned the project some of these large tanks in which to turn fish eggs into roach. Now they have to embark on the next stage of their journey to adulthood. They have to be transported to special lagoons by the river. But they're strong nurtured by Trev and Budgie, who've given their lives to try to turn their ambitious idea into a success. All this complex equipment has been funded and constructed Heath Robinson style by them, along with members of the Roach Club and well-wishers, not least the landowners and businesses along the river who want to see the Roach Shoals return to their former glory. The water level has been lowered to allow the lively fish to be netted more easily and the bags are prepared for their transportation in advance to minimise stress. 
After they've been filled with roach, the bags will be pumped full of oxygen and sealed to ensure a safe journey. Though netting them is a violent process, dead youngsters can be counted on the fingers of two hands. They breed them tough in these parts. Uncountable numbers of perfect Avon roach. The result of lots of determination and hard work. And for the doubters who say it won't work, it sure beats doing nothing to save the species. Supporters like James Allen from the Environment Agency and river keeper Pete Orchard believe that doing nothing isn't an option and it's at times like these when thousands of baby roach have been raised to kickstart the recovery that hope and optimism triumph. Released into carefully prepared lagoons by the river where they're protected from predators, they can grow on safely until they reach a spawning age. At three years old, they'll be released back into the Avon to start the perilous process of creating self-sustaining populations. The lagoons are netted to protect the precious fish from predators during their two-year stay. Once removed, we were fortunate to receive yet more help from Jim Allen and Jim Regglesworth of the Environment Agency, who generously gave up their Saturday time off and also loaned us the gear to enable the roach to be transported to the river. With the help of riverkeeper Pete Orchard, we soon had countless healthy Avon roach to return to the place of their birth. Many hundreds of little roach, now three and a half years old, are released each year in several stretches of the Avon. And though small, these roach will be ready to spawn next spring and start the long process of reinstating self-sustaining populations throughout the river. Tens of thousands are being released. Many will get eaten, of course, but some will survive and that provides the reward for all Trevon Budge's hard work. The survivors also inspire much hope for the future. Bye bye babies, good luck, stay safe and I hope to see you later when you've grown much much bigger. 
creating habitat for them is the next stage in the 10-year plan. And if we control predators, we will give them a chance. And who knows? Maybe in 10 years' time, some will have survived to grow into those legendary giants that made the river famous. And we must try to save them. For without Roach, the Avon has lost some of its soul.